Hello uh, and welcome to the third edition of What Has the Environment Ever Done For Us? Uh, for this month's edition, we have a finance special. Um, we will get through our usual order, uh, headlines, hero uh, and hypocrisy, um, but we're absolutely delighted to welcome Helena Anderson from Ikigai Capital, who we will come to very shortly. But first of all, let's start off um, with Mr. Mitchell, please. Headlines of the month, please. Okay, Johnny, so just very briefly, we've got much more important things to come to, obviously, but this week saw the publication of a report by uh, the International Federation of Consulting Engineers, uh, who were saying that we need to spend somewhere in the order of $7 trillion every year on infrastructure to address climate change. Um, and it goes on to discuss what sort of infrastructure that might be, uh, and uh, I was uh, very interested in, in reading this because uh, our very own Association of Consulting and Engineering uh, also recently published a similar document called uh, Project Speed. Now, I'm not sure if there's any um, anything in this, but the, 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 the current person who, who leads FIDIC, the International uh, um, Federation, is somebody called Nelson Oakenshaken who not long ago left the ACE as that for, from there as being their chief executive. Uh, and, and now our very own managing director, Paul Riley, is uh, chairman of the ACE. When they published something called Project Speed. Uh, and this uh, explores what they call practical steps that need to be uh, taken to unlock delivery to get faster, better, greener investment in infrastructure, spe specifically in rail, homes, hospitals and schools. Now they talk about uh, strengthening the evidence base and making better use of data in project development, uh, digitizing uh, what I would probably call the historically arcane processes involved in developing new projects uh, and focusing decision making around a new approach to value based decision making which goes purely beyond the financial aspects. All of this, however, uh, talks about the speed and the volume that we need to approach uh, the, the issue about infrastructure delivery. And it begs the question about, so what infrastructure do we need to deliver that, create, that requires these massive, fast and urgent programs? Uh, and, and I think there's a complicated picture that sits behind this, particularly here in the UK, um, the recent engagement of organisations such as the Friends of the Earth and the Transport Action Network uh, and others in challenging what major infrastructure decisions are being made, together with the effects of the pandemic, has had a really big influence on what projects are being promoted to be, to be delivered. For example, uh, you know, the Friends of the Earth successfully challenged the airport's national policy statement last year at the Court of Appeal. Uh, and uh, having done that, uh, the Secretary said, say, said that he wouldn't challenge that decision, uh, although Heathrow did decide to challenge that and got the decision overturned at the Supreme Court. Um, even then, John Holland Kay, the Chief Executive, confirmed that Heathrow won't be pursuing a third runway for at least 15 years. So having been two years ago in a pro process of rapid delivery of a third runway for Heathrow, we now found ourselves in a position of no third runway at Heathrow for two years. What else is in store for us? Um, well, we continue to see the Transport Action Network um, challenging the Highways England, for example, about their roads investment strategy, their second roads investment strategy, on the basis that it doesn't comply with the Paris Agreement or similar circumstances. Um, and given that the original decision as to whether or not there was compliance with the Paris Agreement made at Heathrow uh, was made at, at a time when policy was quite formative. Now here we are on the approach to COP26 in Glasgow with our commitments around Paris more clearly understood. Do we really understand what infrastructure under the heading of roads, given the uh, big disruption that we've got coming up in terms of transport over the next few years. What, do, what is going to happen over the next two or three years uh, as we try and make decisions about new infrastructure that needs to be delivered? It's a fascinating area. It's full of new policy areas. It's full of new legal challenges. 
uh, and it's full of decision making uh, on a basis that we don't yet quite understand. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Can we open... there? Is that OK? That sounded like a great webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it puts you on the back foot a little bit, doesn't it, with regard to the uh, uh, just the the the, yeah, the whole system thinking on that. Well, I think we've got an hour, right? We should be able to get through pretty much everything to solve that problem. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm, but I, I'm, I'm making notes. Yeah, I'm going to have to pause <laughs> you on that because I and and oh, Nick, an enormous apology because I also forgot to introduce at the beginning that Nick has read a book this month, and he's oh. he's he's. he's He's desperate to share this. No, no, no. I'm, wa I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I can wait. You're waiting. <laughs> okay. I'm just well, thinking about the enormity of uh, the idea that people are now brave enough and determined enough to challenge policy and they're not willing to just take it on the chin. Now, whether seven trillion, it's interesting. Seven trillion seems to be the new one billion uh, mark. Because in my book that I read, I'm sure I could find the, the figure seven trillion. Uh, is in there. So obviously that's the new trendy phrase. But it is amazing with the Heathrow and with other government policies, people are now really gearing themselves up to take the policymakers to task, which from my reading, I now understand is much more important than I'd given credit to uh, before. Well, I think there's a bit of spin in there, if I may, because uh -oh. the Heathrow decision was not based on the Paris Agreement. It was based on whether or not the national planning statements apply to Heathrow and it was a very legal very technical matter that determined that but people are catching on to it because they want to see aviation decarbonized and so it's a, a useful event that can be spun in a way that demonstrates that NGOs have an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. This would be a very tough webinar. This would be I, very I, tough. I, I'd be delighted. I actually read the judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you're absolutely right. It turned on a very specific interpretation about whether or not our compliance with the Paris Agreement was considered to be national policy or not. Because if it was considered national policy, then the national policy statement had to comply. If it didn't, it didn't. And 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 that that was sort of a my, my a bit of a reference to arcane processes in a sense because, you know, uh, actually there's some hugely important decisions that we've got to make over the course of the next few years. What I think what I think is worth noting about that, because maybe it leads us into the discussion about infrastructure, not that I, I want to, I, obviously I can't wait my turn, but I'm very passionate about aviation and I, I just want to make one point because this links into a lot of the work that needs to be done on the ground around decarbonisation of such an important industry. And while that decision had absolutely nothing to do with how we were going to achieve our carbon targets. What happened is that everybody interpreted it as being a trend. Mm. And therefore, you have um, airports all around the country, and we work with a number of them as we with Stantec, who have um, taken that as no planning decisions we've made in favour of expansion of airports. This is obviously pre-COVID, but, you know, similar considerations now in terms of the licence to operate that those planning decisions will simply not get through unless there is a serious consideration of a sustainable framework for growth. And almost immediately after that decision, we collectively were approached to, to look at how you can finance decarbonisation, diversify revenue streams, and in a post-COVID environment, that's only intensified. So whether or not it was a technical legal decision is neither here nor there now. The, the airline industry, the airport industry has understood that they are not going to survive. It is an existential crisis for them post-COVID that either they go jet zero or they go home. So the thing, the thing that I find frustrating on behalf of the industry, though, is that there's a lot of talk about R&D, and I'm sure we'll get onto that with um, the uh, Nick, Nick's book, but there's a real focus on how you change the tech but unless you change the infrastructure around the tech, the tech is not possible. So it's the, the much less sexy infrastructure that we need to be talking about to have our airports and our ports ready for the carbon transition. Um, but it's not as exciting as Friends of the Earth complaining about a third runway at Heathrow or talking about the latest hydrogen plane. So we tend not to talk about it.
And, yeah. and to segue uh, very nicely into the next section, Helena, as well, do, do we also not need to completely change the way that that industry is financed too? And I don't answer, don't answer that question just now, because I think it's probably time, actually, that we properly introduce you to our audience. And I'm going to pass over at this point to, to our colleague, Jenny, uh, to pick up the uh, baton on that one uh, and, and get into the nitty gritty about um, yourself and Ikigai Capital. Jenny. Great. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, everyone. Um, OK, I'll step back a little bit and then perhaps we can get back to some heated debate. <laughs> um, so, Helena, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Helena founded Ikigai Capital back in 2017 after two years uh, working at the UK Department for International Trade, where she was the head of energy capital investment. Um, Helena, can you please tell us a little bit about Ikigai Capital and your work? Uh, with pleasure. Um, I'm not quite sure where to start, so maybe I will start with our mission and what Ikigai means, because that might frame the discussion. Um, so Ikigai is a Japanese word, and it means loosely reason for living. And uh, I set up Ikigai in the wake of the passing of my life partner. So in a, on a very personal level, it has meaning to me. But I also set it up as someone who was a bit of a Japanophile my whole life, who worked a great deal with Japanese investors when I was in government, looking at how to attract capital into the UK to drive the energy transition. Because uh, Japan is a major investor in, in all the tech across the energy transition space. And they have a wall of institutional capital that's looking for markets to get higher returns. So there was a real uh, kind of uh, Japanese flavour to what we were doing. But... The philosophy of Ikigai is really, really important to what we do. Ikigai at its core means that to be happy in life, one must do what they are good at, what they're passionate about, where their skills um, lie and where what makes money. And so it's these pillars of Ikigai that drive what the work that we do. And when I was in government, um, I noticed that there was a particular niche that was not being filled by the private sector or by anyone, by government as well, that um, was this bridge between uh, investors, uh, users of energy, major users of energy, so uh, infrastructure players like airports and ports, as well as energy intensive industry, um, the innovators of the world, the tech companies, um, and government. And so what we try and do at Ikigo is we try and bridge that gap, but we bridge it from a financing perspective. So we're all ex-finance professionals. Myself, I was a lawyer for 15 years in project finance. My business partner, Roberto, he, he uh, was previously a banker and uh, a fund manager. So we're not coming at it from the perspective of a technical and engineering thought process. We're coming at it from the perspective of how do you join the dots across those stakeholders? How do you solve some of the gaps in the market around commercialization of tech, supporting local authorities to make the right decisions to attract private sector investment in the energy transition, uh, working with investors to understand how they can decarbonize their portfolios and fund that um, on a third party finance basis, um, help industry to understand what technology should apply and how they can get that funded. That's kind of our, our focus. Um, and it sort of reflects the, the four pillars of, of Ikigai, which is the reason we, we set up the business. So when I was in government, we used to talk about this conveyor belt or two conveyor belts, actually. One where you're dragging institutional money, lower cost capital, further and further along the risk curve so that they become more and more engaged in the energy transition. So you're moving uh, money from, you know, pension funds and insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, um, some of the big strategic investors, you're moving their money towards where the tech and the projects need to move in this direction. So they need to become more bankable using proven technology. The technology itself has to be commercialized and ready for use in a project finance environment. So if you can get those two conveyor belts to converge, which is what we're trying to do at Ikigai, then you can deliver projects at scale and you can do it with innovative technology, but in a bankable way. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for that background, because that was a really interesting visual analogy for me because I've heard I've heard other people talking similarly about 
it's high risk. I remember them talking about the offshore winds and trying to get floating offshore winds to take off. And but no one's ever put it in that way in terms of trying to bring these two areas together in that way. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I think it would be really interesting for some of our listeners and for everyone on the call to hear a little bit um, about the projects that you're actually involved in. Um, would you be happy to talk about a couple of those? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I think I, I understand you have lots of local authority listeners in on your podcast. So maybe I'll focus on the work that we're doing with um, local authorities and uh, local enterprise partnerships, because um, that's been a really important part of our growth over the last few years. Um, one of the trends that was absolutely key for me and, and, and a focus for Ikigai was on um, energy-led industrial clusters. When I was in government, I helped to draft the industrial strategy. And so that really informed our thinking about the dual trends of decarbonisation and devolution. And where you see those, those two um, trends coming together in the UK is in industrial cluster work, city solution work and district work. And so we're doing projects with technical advisors across all of those uh, sort of subsets. So we're working in uh, Cheshire in the Northwest on an industrial decarbonisation route map for the industrial zone around there, um, which is one of the six industrial clusters um, as identified by government. And we're putting together the pipeline of projects, both um, ones that have been identified by stakeholders locally and ones that we've kind of created with a blank sheet of paper because we think that they're what the area needs to decarbonise across all energy vectors. So one of the core aspects of what we do is always focusing on energy systems. So we don't look at just power or just heat or just transport and, and fuel vectors. We're looking across the piece because that's what's necessary for industrial decarbonisation. And our focus is on how do you create a capital investment plan around bankable projects and then bring the private sector in to deliver it. So very, you know, the boring nuts and bolts of how you convert 7 trillion scale of, of investment into smaller projects that are actually creating the conditions for building blocks towards the energy transition. Um, in Scotland, we're working on a uh, the Glasgow Climate Neutral Innovation District, which is a core mm. bank of COP26, which yeah. is the um, district in the centre of Glasgow, uh, looking again from an all vector basis at how we create uh, bankable solutions for decarbonisation. They're of a, more of a mixed use residential type uh, environment with a couple of major industrial stakeholders and a big hospital. Um, in Manchester, we're doing a... Um, a heat network in the centre of town or in the southern corridor of Manchester, uh, which is uh, both power and, and heat. So it's not just um, a, a heat network, so it also includes private wire. Um, so we're getting to grips with how a heat network or a private wire network expands over time across different types of um, energy users, starting with um, hospital, moving on to um, more residential, moving on to more industrial uh, scale energy use um, and we've just been appointed to advise uh, the Thames Estuary Growth Board um, which is the pu public private uh, partnership if you like that's been pulled together to deliver uh, amongst other things a hydrogen ecosystem for the Thames mm -hmm. Estuary and a capital investment plan to deliver that so um, I'm sure that there are various um, perspectives on this call that um, will have very, very relevant insights to, to all of those. Um, I guess the one that you were very interested in, Jenny, was Net Zero Layston, which is probably yeah. the last one I would mention, which is um, a Net Zero town in Suffolk uh, that we're working on a not-for-profit basis with um, EDF uh, as one of the, the private sector sponsors. Um, Layston happens to be near Sizewell, um, the nuclear power station, but actually this project is independent of that and it's looking at how um, what are the optimal structures for decarbonising a, a small town that's largely residential focus so mm. you notice what I'm talking I'm always talking about what's the asset class what's the asset class because that's how investors think it's not really about just the tech it's about how that tech is applied in an asset class context and then how do you make that asset class uh, viable because our, our investors are organised to think in that way and so what we're trying to do with NZL is to 
um, create a prototype which is replicable across the country and then to reach out to local authorities across the country and pull them into the project so that we can create the sort of scale that makes um, residential decarbonisation on a 5,000 homes basis interesting to very large investors. That's really interesting and well you've talked about a whole range of interesting projects there and um, just touching on that point about local authorities and areas trying to decarbonise uh, from my perspective it's quite a complex quite a complex picture it's a big challenge it's got to be delivered over time have you got any thoughts or any advice for where to start maybe drawing on that project you were just talking about yeah well where to start depends on what your problem is so where to start is understanding the problem at a granular level yeah. and I guess you what you're picking up on there Jenny is one of the things that um, was fundamental when we set up Ikigai and, and actually came about because um, my my business partner Roberto he called me one day in government before we were working together and he said you know data is really important I really think that everything related to the energy transition it all comes back to data energy DNA that's the future and at the time I really didn't understand what he was saying and I think I nodded and vaguely took notes but in in hindsight it was probably the most important thing that anyone had ever said to me as is the basis on which we now engage with um, asset owners uh, investors with diversified portfolios and the first thing we say is do you really know what's going on in your business as far as energy consumption is concerned and usually they say uh, well I've got uh, you know half hour meters <laughs> and I think when they installed that kit, they put a some sort of sensor on it. So, you know, we're tracking whether or not it's performing that piece of kit. Yeah. And like, okay, so you don't know what's happening across all these different types of energy vector or uh, temperature or vibrations. So how are you doing predictive maintenance? And they usually look at you blankly uh, and they can't tell you exactly why they're spending so much money on certain aspects of their energy budget. So somebody comes along and says, hey, um, we build solar plants, do you want one? And they say, I guess, what harm can it do? Uh, but they haven't actually solved their carbon problem in yeah. doing that because they haven't understood that maybe their biggest issue is around heat loss or um, somebody comes along and says, hey, you should change your boiler, but they haven't realized that they're in another process in their, in, their, their business, they're generating huge amounts of waste heat that they could be capturing and using instead. So without understanding at a granular level, what's going wrong, you don't make the best investment decisions. And so from a funder perspective, we would always say, you need to know what your problem is before you can look at what the solution is and how you can move forward to actually deliver it. And from a financing perspective, that de-risks the whole structure because you know from the word go exactly what vectors you need to control in whatever solution you deliver. So I would always say we need to know more. Digitization, digital twinning, yeah. um, IoT platforms, all of that bu those buzzwords, they're, there, they're buzzwords for a reason because you have to understand your business before you can do anything about it. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that we focus a lot, sorry to come back to the seven trillion, but uh, we focus a lot on scale because everybody is incredibly excited once you've got a hundred million or 300 million pound project people will throw resources at it even when it's completely you know a vanity project when they don't realize that sometimes it's the little in, in interventions which prove a business case on a structural level that then lead to all of the momentum that you need to actually deliver at scale. So I'll give you an example on Thames Estuary. One of the first things that we're doing is we're looking at the capacity at a port level of switching equipment, so cranes and, and other constant use equipment, switching that across to hydrogen fuel cells. Why? Because I know that in a high use environment like that, I can demonstrate the business case on day one for switching across to hydrogen fuel cells. So if we can demonstrate that at one port, because they could finance it using third party finance on a, on a very well structured basis with a credit worthy counterparty over long term with stable cash flows, if I can do that with no government intervention, then all the three other ports that are in the immediate facility will say, well, why haven't we got that? And once mm -hmm. they've done that, they've already installed the necessary 
IoT solutions to understand what they're doing. So you're halfway there. Then you move on to the things that actually require government intervention beyond what already exists. But if you never get people using the tech in a way that makes sense for their business, you never yeah. move forward. So, you know, I understand why we talk about scale because that's how you move huge amounts of institutional capital. And, and obviously we, we subscribe to that as well. But actually there's some beauty in the, the tiny little interventions and the, the complexity involved in seeing how they work as a system, which actually can really transform an economy. Very, yeah. very I think you've really struck a chord with some of the previous conversations we've had on this webinar where we've been talking about it's really important to try and drive to action. It doesn't need to be huge scale action first, but you do need to sort of direct your efforts in the right way. Therefore, you, as you were saying there, you need to understand your situation in the first place. And unfortunately, sometimes you see, we see, I think, well-intentioned efforts, but they get a bit misguided towards jumping to a solution like PV or let's just put yeah. in renewable energy rather than let's look at energy efficiency first, what's actually going to be cost effective and have the best social environmental outcomes. And, totally. um, and yeah. some of that's driven by balance sheet funding. So you're looking at payback periods rather than looking at what is the rate of return for an external investor. So sometimes you make decisions on that basis. But to be honest, the government's not helping. So the, the funding announcements that they made in the wake of COVID, though well-intentioned to try and drive money into local authorities as quickly as possible, they, they said to the local, a number of local authorities that we work with, the most ridiculous statement I've ever heard, if you've got shovel-ready projects, we'll fund them. Well, how on earth do you think we got shovel-ready projects when we didn't have any funding to do feasibility work? And you haven't given us any time to engage with private sector stakeholders in order to pull something together. So we can't just matching up the need for 100 million overnight. And if we don't do that, then we won't get it. So we come up with some scheme that looks like it's shovel ready, but hasn't really been thought through. Or we yeah. put in our own land to deliver a solution, even when that land is not the optimal way in which you might deliver an EV network or or EV charging network or, or what have you, because that's the way you get something together to meet a grant requirement within a month. That's incredibly bad planning and it creates terribly perverse incentives that aren't ultimately going to support the growth of a decarbonised economy. Okay. <laughs> so, so I think what you said, Helen, one of the things that, that cracks me up is this expression shovel ready is becomes mm. the new kind of kind of name of the time, isn't it? At the moment, everything, you know, I'll give you 300 million pounds if you can give me some shovel ready projects. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I'm out of school, but I promise to give you some controversy on this thing. As you know, I used to work in the Department for International Trade. And hopefully no one from there is listening to this call. <laughs> we Don't worry, it'll be put on a we website, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can edit this out. Um, so we had a directive. You know, when I started there, we were we were trying to do what only government can do. That was that was our mantra. Only do what only government can do. I don't do what the Green Investment Bank did. Um, and uh, we then changed, the strategy then changed just before I, I left to only work on shovel ready projects. And I would say, well, you've now put me in a position where I'm, I'm competing with one, two, three people with JP Morgan and Rothschilds and you name any investment bank on the block because that's what they want. They mm -hmm. want shovel ready projects that they can put in front of their pension funds. What government's supposed to be doing is taking the, what's mm. the expression, the pig's ear into a whatever princess purse. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be pulling together the difficult things that wouldn't otherwise be done, which hence why we set our picky guy because we we're trying to fix that problem. But, but the point is that's exactly where government should be intervening and putting in the hard yards where it won't otherwise be done, but it has massive economic benefit. Vicky, at this point, I'd like to bring the politician in the room into that conversation. Well, have, you, have you got any views on, on that, shovel ready or not? I, I feel that pain, I really do, last year when we, we had exactly that with the local enterprise partnership money running out and if you don't spend it by the 31st of March, it's gone and you're like, okay so you're going to pull our money away but now you're asking us to come up with some new projects uh which have had no due diligence done on them uh and then turn them around in in 
at the end of the tale, I mean, what's the point? You might as well just extend the time. So that is just music to my ears and will be music to the ears of, of, of all council leaders. Um, but I suppose the answer to that is, what is the solution? <laughs> Well, I should say I give enormous credit to um, Cheshire and Warrington uh, and the whole of the Northwest, but particularly Cheshire and Warrington Lab and um, the Thames Estuary, because they are genuinely trying to push back on that and say, OK, well, the way that the world works when you're developing projects is as follows. What we need to do is bring in some specialist support to help those on the ground who are trying to do their best in industry and in government to actually shape really strong, uh, well-structured projects so that we can then decide what do we need public sector funding to do and what can we actually take to the private sector because it's so well-structured we can bring in that institutional money rather than um, assuming that unless you grab at that grant, there'll be no other money. Actually, there's a wall of money out there. It just needs good projects. And so if, if you support those projects to come through through targeted feasibility study work, working with the private sector, but, but pushing it into the areas that have the greatest benefit from a socioeconomic perspective, then, you know, you really drive forward a huge pipeline. That's what we're seeing in, in Cheshire and what we're seeing in Thames. Nick, you were leaning in there. I was. I was leaning, leaning in. And because you know, I've read this book. And... <laughs> um, I know and we're all joking about it because I'm, I'm, I am delighted to have read this book. The, the, uh, can I go on to do a bit about the book? Because I think it leads into some of the issues that we're getting into. Do, uh, go on. So I have yeah, do you know this book? Which book are you talking about? Go on, Keith, you've got it as well, haven't you? Um, <laughs> and, we're doing I an act of Bill Gates. I, I, I want to start off, if I can, by apologising to everyone who's been campaigning uh, been studying and developing an understanding of climate change and its effects, potential effects on our, our world for all their lives, because I've just woken up to what you've been doing and I really appreciate it. And I apologise that only now have I got an enthusiasm uh, from a book uh, by a computer geek. Um, but one of the things I do think that Bill Gates has possibly done is there will undoubtedly be reasons to argue and debate things in this book. And, and actually, having worked in politics for the last 12 years, there is no single policy that is unanimously accepted by anyone in this world. There is always someone who thinks you're barking mad and they'll vote for the other party. So let's ex accept that this will not be unanimously agreed. Uh, what I do love about it is it's like switching on a computer and finding Windows loads up and you click a mouse and it does something that only... Bill Gates could have uh, created. Before that, computers were a mystery to me. Um, it gets into the details of what a lot of people watching this know and have lived with and have had to struggle over endless conversations. It shows that fossil fuels have been adopted for nations who wanted to grow quickly. And that's a really hard thing for a country that wants to be more economically powerful than it is to look at China and see how it's done it on the back of fossil fuels and then being told you can't have that. Um, it's the longevity of carbon, the understanding of it. All of this is known by all of you. I'm just the numpty in the room, I'm the dunce. But it, it, it's a clear book that's easy to read and it gives you information that really fills it in so that you're confident of perhaps looking to the future about adaption and migration, uh, migrating the whole issues. And what I felt comforting about this was he told me that in this book, uh, reading it, that actually there aren't solutions to some of the problems, but we've got to find them and we've got to have a plan for finding them. But in the meantime, there's lots of things we can do. And some of those actually cause problems. So to electrify all the cars in this country will cause an uh, increase in electricity demand. And we will struggle to deliver that with completely clean electricity. And there's a whole issue behind that. And so none of this is straightforward in any shape or form. Um, I think that the book says you can't achieve any of this without consensus. And I think that what he's tried to do is create a framework that we can debate more cleanly what the issues are that we have to get consensus on. And the consensus is not just with the politicians, 
it's with us who vote them in because at the end <laughs> it comes through about our own influence on this go on vicky I think, I think that's the point in what helena was just saying was about you know a lot of forgive me Helena, but a lot of what you said to me went in one ear and out the other because it was finance speak um and because it was but but in order to get the funding you have to convert this stuff into the language that those financiers understand talking yeah. about those assets and, and the yeah. portfolio and, and what bill gates has done is he's turned it into our speak you know i now can explain to anybody that how you make cement you know, and they're actually, you know, no, how you make concrete. Uh, and I can now work out that really simple equation about, you know, where carbon comes in. I couldn't have done that before the weekend. But if people like you and me are able to do that, then perhaps we can then process some of the more complicated stuff because we go, okay, it's now not totally foreign. And it is about getting the right language to the right people so that we can switch on. Helena's clients won't switch on if you don't speak their language. And, and I think that's what Bill Gates' book un yeah. unlocks, but, that but, language. But hold that thought, because I, I want to just get through a few more things, because I think that uh, uh, one, one of the other issues I really found great value in this book was he broke it down for me in, in digestible sizes. You know, the issues about climate change and uh, the greenhouse gases, you know, there is aspects we can do in power. There's aspects we can do in making things. There's aspects we can do in the poor old cows. I felt so sorry for cows. Because they've got to go. They've got to. Oh, no, come on, Nick. Let, off I'm with the cow. A project right now is a circular economy project for the dairy industry. Please don't deprive me of that. No, but but interesting point about that was as I read this story and I understood that that implication, which you know I've heard it all before. I've heard lots of this before. I then started thinking about what are we going to do to help all those farmers? How are we going to help those sectors uh, during a transition period? because that is seriously something that has to be addressed. But then going can I, on to the- Can I tell you what, what, why he's wrong about that? What's wrong about that? Well, because when you think as a system, you don't need, necessarily need to kill off the industries that give us such socioeconomic economic benefits as, as the dairy industry, for example. So in, in a world where you think that anything that well, what we're doing is we're decarbonizing power then you look at the dairy industry and you go we've got massive methane problem it's polluting the waterways how can we possibly sustain this industry in a decarbonized world but actually now we're getting to the point where we're looking at so many different technologies that can actually decarbonize that industry as a system that we actually have the hope of saving the value that lies in in these and I don't disagree, but the system, what I'm concerned about is that we're dealing with a lot of things, not in a holistic view. No. We're not. And that danger is that without the holistic view, we start to see people falling in the cracks. Now, one of the things that he goes on to say, which, again, I've heard this before. I've worked on a project to do with Bangladesh. You know, are we working out where the people of Bangladesh are going to live? because the speed at which we are going to save them from the rising water uh, is not necessarily fast enough to stop that. And what, where are the Fenlands going to go? Where are all the Fenland farmers going in Cambridgeshire? And the Dutch, bit of an issue with the Dutch, we've got to help them. So there's areas of, it's not just in one area that we have to come up with a plan. We have to adapt the world in which we're living. We have to adapt the way that we're working in the meantime. I think that, um, the ultimate thing that I came up with was a, it's a plan for getting to zero. It's the first time someone's presented me with a plan that had a holistic view about it, that was looking at everything in your way as a system, but it was coming up with the bigger system that I could buy into. And I really welcomed that. And I really welcomed the description of what a business could do, what a government could do, which I think is coming back to what you were frustrated with the government about where they fit in. Um, and what we could do, and one of the interesting things that he says, and I, I don't want to be a spoiler to all the, the, the what's in the book, and I haven't, there's no way you could do it, um, is about we need to start telling our leaders and everything, uh, and for me, local government, uh, about there is a, a holistic view we have to have. In local government, there are some really great ones. In fact, I read an article about someone in a London council whose job is about decarbonising the council. Fantastic. But it has to be in every aspect of that council's leadership. That has to be 
a member of the, the, the strategic direction of the council. It is not a junior role. And I think we had this conversation off level, you know, hiring someone here is lovely. You pat, pat it on the head of all the people in the, in, the, um, in the lobbying groups, but actually the chief executive, someone very close to the chief executive should be in that management system saying, every decision we make has to stop saying, we've understood what we do to the environment, but we actually now have to know that we're doing something positive. I and there are some councils, I know Vicky, well, no, I was going to say, talk about finance and saying that the, the article I wrote about this last week, um, which was prompted by the uh, the Sunday Times um, supplement, which uh, Nick made me read from start to finish last weekend. Um, it talked about whether chief execs should actually be incentivized around um, their, you know, the ESG, isn't it? The, the environmental, social and governance um, issues. So I'm wondering whether what Helena's view is on that, because we, you know, green finance is, is now overtaking, um, you know, traditional finance. Um, and I talked about the case of our council that refused to divest from fossil fuels from the pension fund because it was very niche. And now, two years on, I'm thinking this is ridiculous because that's absolutely what we need to do. But if, if the CEO is being incentivized and paid according to the, the performance of the ESG, that's how surely how you really buy into it, isn't it, Helena? Well, I think you make a very compelling point. Um, but what I would say is any CEO that doesn't think that, or CFO that doesn't think they're already incentivized, doesn't really understand the impact of climate change on their business. Because the way we look at it is that our business is all about generating value. How do you generate value for stakeholders in the context of a carbon constrained economy? And there are two key ways I would say a local authority needs to be, or anyone, industry, anyone has to be looking at this. One is from the perspective of what are your stranded assets or potentially stranded assets? And in what time frame did they become stranded assets? And the other one is, what are your potential climate opportunities? How do you look at your asset base and think, how can I actually diversify and increase my revenue by the way I react to this situation or proactively engage with this situation? So let me give you two examples. So um, some of you know I, I sit on the regulated board of Places for People, which is the largest private social housing uh, association in the country, 200,000 homes under management. And uh, it's an amazing organisation. Uh, about a year ago, I think maybe a bit longer, they started looking at um, the asset base that they were dealing with. And they categorised the different um, uh, housing and, and um office and, and leisure stock according to uh, its potential to become subject to regulation or subject to devaluation because they would it would no longer be an attractive asset to live in um, as a consequence of climate change or increased you know regulation around um, environmental aspects etc and they looked at their whole portfolio to see what their liquidity risk was so what are the chances that these uh, properties will be unsellable. What their valuation risk was, what are the chances that these properties would no longer be as valuable as they were before because they're co more costly to operate um, or there are you know, other reasons why climate change has had an impact. And they started to make decisions as to divestment and to upgrading of the stock according to the presumption of further climate regulation and further impacts of climate change affecting their portfolio. And so that stops being, I need an environmental person sitting next to CEO. And it starts being, sorry, CFO, how are you managing the future? Because the future is a karma constrained world. And the second example is one from um, the airport that uh, Johnny and I have been working on in, in Glasgow. I'm very proud of what they're, they're doing. And they were the, one of the first airports that grasped, pre-COVID, remember, grasped the importance of revenue diversification. How do you look at your real estate assets 
as opportunities to monetize them in the context of a uh, carbon constrained world. So how can you use your, your real estate assets to generate ele green electrical power? How do, how do you use your assets to um, for the purposes of delivering a battery that might generate services to the grid? How do you look at uh, selling electricity to perhaps the um, industry that sits around your, uh, your airport? How can you use what is a challenge for you as a value generation device, looking at your context and looking at um, the way in which you use energy? So your cost suddenly becomes a revenue stream. And in post-COVID land, that proved to be very prophetic because where once upon a time people were like, huh, why would we do that? Energy is a cost. Um, in post-COVID land, people are like, oh, we don't have an airport operating right now. I wish we had a power station. So um, that's why I, I totally agree with what you said, Vicky. But anybody who is not thinking that this is actually core to what they do now has not fully grasped the challenge. Exactly. But I think that that's, that's where the, I'm sort of coming from with the book, with the greatest respect to everyone who's, who's living and breathing this. And, you know, as Johnny said, uh, you know, when I was talking about it earlier, uh, you know, sometimes the experts are not the best at communicating the need for it. And that's a frustration that a lot of people have felt. I have certainly witnessed um, uh, about a year, well, when I was last out of the country, allowed out and about in the trains and things, uh, a council absolutely flabbergasted, having just spent the evening celebrating uh, climate emergency action being taken by their full council, everyone uh, in the chamber supporting it unanimously, uh, to then have two absolutely charming uh, activists ask them at the cabinet meeting the next morning, so what are you going to do about it now? And, you know, there is, we, we've got to bring everyone together. And I think that one of the things I found with this book, I didn't feel lectured at, I felt ed educated. I didn't feel nervous because I had someone who has great inspiration and belief in the future that it's all quite possible but maybe we need to get you involved now rather than leave people on the sidelines later and one of the things I think that really a big challenge for this world is if you look at what has happened with science and finding a vaccine vaccines even we've done amazing we haven't found one we found a whole load of vaccines for COVID-19 in a much shorter period of time. It shows that the creativity and talent of the scientists, when put and given the finance and given the direction and leadership that only a government can, then we can do it. And that gave me great hope when I started to think about that to what uh, Bill Gates says about, I believe it can be done. But we have to get going. Soviet though, Nick. Are you advocating central planning? No, but I think that if you don't bring the governments with you, you're not going to get it at all. So let's not throw anyone out of this uh, party. And I think that one of the other things that I find really interesting is I hadn't got the importance of the timings, putting it in the context of timings overall, and whether the timings are arguable, whether you believe in them. Uh, uh, the idea that we've got nine years to really focus on getting the, the, the stepping stones in place and that government law that exists today can actually hinder innovation and progress and that we have to get all our governments in the world looking at how they're enabling people like you to move even faster and others. I think that that really brought it home to me about these dates that sound terribly arbitrary at 2030 and 2050. Uh, and I'm certainly willing, having read this book, to do my little bit to move this forward and make sure that we have half a chance of responding. And I'm going to take take that, Nick, and use that as a segue because we're now coming up to uh, to the hour mark, uh, which is not too far away. And we we still got to get through very very quickly um, heroes and hypocrisy, um, uh, and that that discussion. There's a few things in there, Helena. From from me, it actually reminded me of a conversation I had with the local authority 12 years ago, where they turned around and said, "Well, energy is not core business." To me and I had their energy bill in front of me and my response was well I can see it is core business I can see what your energy bill looks like it and that's scary when you look at that so mm. it's just a simple shift of a dial of what is core business uh, and what does what good looks like is a is a very simple outcome 
Um, so so we're moving on now to, and we're going to start with uh, the hypocrisy of uh, of the month, uh, which I'm going to pick up before picking over to Vicky on on Hero. Uh, and this month, this is really quite simple, actually. It was an article was uh, was sent over to me, and it just re reminded uh, me and us about why we talk about hypocrisy. And it's not to stick there and point the finger at people, but you can't you can't understand the future and you can't understand the problems unless you're willing to talk about the problems. And it's all well and good talking about successes all the time, but we've also got a whole range of problems out there um, that we need to to reflect on. And actually, uh, there was a great interview with uh, Professor Mike Bernalese from Lancaster University who pointed this this out. Actually, don't be scared of hypocrisy. We need to talk about hypocrisy, um, and and in in particular, don't let it put you off because it's very easy to be stymied by somebody pointing the finger at you and especially if you're nervous about a subject and a market area if you're a business perhaps that, that you're just feeling your way through if you're always constantly worried about somebody pointing the finger at you about hypocrisy you're never going to move forward so let's celebrate the success let's celebrate um uh, doing the right thing but let's also understand the, the, the parts of this that makes uh, hypocrisy um, happen. Um, the article, actually, there was an article in CNN which was pointing the finger at the United Kingdom and, and Norway as, as being hypocrites um, because we'd have re recently celebrated some success about kind of like the, the European country that has decarbonized the quickest, or decarbonized our power infrastructure the fastest. And this article essentially, well, yeah, but, but look, you do this over here, but you do that. Now, if we all focused on the, uh, but, then we wouldn't move forward. And then also, we we know this is going to happen, but we've got COP26 coming up in, in November. Somebody's going to go, oh, look, look at the hypocrisy of all of these people flying from around the world to an event in Glasgow. Well, you know, we need people to come together. They need to break bread. They need to be able to do a deal, especially on Article 6, six about who, who pays, um, which we talked about uh, in last month's uh, um uh, show. Um, so, so there is elements of this that we can't be stymied by hypocrisy, but let's carry on talking about those and, 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 let, and let's move forward uh, and then work out how do we unpick that hypocrisy and, and put plans together at a stepping stone, one at a time, to move these things forward and, and a problem shared is a problem halved, isn't it? Um, so, so really moving on from that and, and, and to celebrate the heroes, Vicky, this is important because when we can put people up on a pedestal and go look at the amazing things that this is going on just here, the more we could learn as well. So over to you, Vicky, hero of the yeah, month sure. So, so, so what was quite interesting was that until a couple of days ago when I was uh, asked to read a 610-page document, uh, no, you know, <laughs> note to self, I haven't read the whole thing, but I've tried to absorb as much as I can at the same time as getting through this very good book <laughs> Bill Gates had written. Um, until a couple of days ago, I was quite keen on the hero of the month not being a human. Because, um, you know, and actually that's a bit of a segue to who our hero is, because, um, you know, nature is actually the biggest hero in all of this, isn't it? Um, and so I was quite keen until recently that Cottony Aster was going to be my hero of the month. Um, and, and Keith is looking horrified, obviously <laughs> hasn't seen the article, that basically <laughs> that, that, that wonderful plant that's in all our suburban gardens has been found um, to be 20% more efficient than most other plants in dealing with roadside pollution. Now, as a former council leader who has arguments about how long the grass is, um, if you could plant these things down the sides of all of our roads, you would not only deal with air pollution and increase biodiversity, you'd get rid of the problem of cutting the damn grass. Brilliant. And then along came Sir Partha Desgupta, and absolutely screwed my idea of making coffee out of the hero. <laughs> um, and that was in his wonderful piece, which was the economics of biodiversity. And I think it brings us straight back round to what Helena was saying. And that is when you put nature into economic terms, lots more people start getting it. And we've had this about, you know, how do you put social value? How do you how do you capture all of that? And one of the things that he's that um, Sir David Attenborough says in his introduction to the report um, is that nature is our home and good economics demands that we manage it better. And this whole report, which is absolutely fascinating. And I'm you know, if you could turn it into a book, we could perhaps give it to Nick to read it. But it uses the language of economics. So it talks about nature being our global portfolio of assets 
you use that language, Helena's clients will be lapping it up. Um, it talks about supply and demand. And it basically says that we have to do three things. First of all, humanity must ensure that demand does not exceed supply and that nature, we help nature to increase the supply. That seems fairly obvious with my Keynesian brain on. Then we have to change the measure of economic success um, so that it's a sustainable model. And the third thing we have to do, and this bit's critical, is we have to transform our institutions and our system, namely our finance and our education system, to enable and sustain the change. Because if we don't actually get the future generations continuing to buy into it, the rest of it's a load of rubbish. So, uh, you know, I, it nearly was Cotton Yaster. Elon Musk had a little bit in there with, with, with Mars. But yeah, so, so Professor Sir Partha Dasgupta, um, I think, um, you know, hats off to you, sir. You are our hero of the month. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, can I just throw in um, one other little hero for me? Because cool. Jenny and I were talking about uh, Nick's book review. Um, I was suggesting that we all talk about what book changed our lives. Yeah. And Vicky, there is a book that you should read if you enjoyed uh, the, the work that you just spoke about. It's called Natural Capitalism. It's by Paul Hawken. And I read it when I was 18 years old and it changed my life because he was the first popular author to talk about the three things that you just talked about. Uh, and he was the person who invented the concept of energy as a service or whatever product as a service. The idea of changing the economic relationships we have from asset ownership to service provision changed the way we conceptualized value and therefore led to the beginning of the circular economy. And so um, while we are still talking about those things, um, I am now... 42, so that was quite a while ago. Um, and yeah, I would urge anybody who wants a flashback um, to what we were saying then, um, read Natural Capitalism. Righty ho, I shall do that once I've finished Bill Gates. <laughs> yeah, one book at a time. Yeah, and I yeah, think- no, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go back to a thriller after this. I, I, need, I, I need some escapism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a science so, fiction thriller. So, so Johnny, I just wanted, you know, as we were closing, just to draw this back because we started uh, this webinar talking about the choices that we all need to make in terms of uh, infrastructure and what we need to be investing in and the priorities that we need to put in. And we were framing that around Fiddick's recent report. Uh, and Helena said something really interesting to me right early in your, uh, in, in your interview about you know this isn't about the tech but it's about how we adapt the infrastructure to be mm. able to work yeah. with the tech as it develops because we have you know we've we have we've built the world that sits around us and now all of a sudden we're going to start using it in a different way uh and so my qu my question really is how do we make that sexy to do in in boris johnson's world of build back better you know, yeah. There's an awful lot of stuff that we need to do, I think, that is around adaptation of infrastructure rather than big new kit. And if that's the case, how do we make it sexy so that becomes part of our future agenda? Uh, and answer that question in one minute, Helena. <laughs> well, my, my hero of the month was going to be the weather in Texas, because <laughs> the way in which you make this sexy is you look at what has just happened yeah. with, with a once in a hundred year event happening every year. And you suddenly realize the costs that would be associated of not uh, transforming our infrastructure. Because Texas has some of the largest wind farms in the world, the most advanced technology in the world, but their grid infrastructure is aching. Yeah. And yeah. they are not connected as a system to the rest of the United States. And so if you want an example of something, you know, that should be a Hollywood film, and therefore is very sexy to avoid, <laughs> then you only have to look at how important infrastructure is in that instance. And a point well made with by Bill Gates as well. It's exactly a problem <laughs> he identified. You're gonna agree with him so much in this book. 
<laughs> well, I think we need to no, do just it. Just back Nick up there. He does. He does talk about how the yeah. isolationism of the different places in America is actually undermining how we get through this problem. And, and that's exactly what I read about Texas. They don't. They don't share and trade. Yeah. And, yeah, they, yeah. Have, they have grown in state infrastructure, but they don't have resilient microgrids. So yeah. they don't have the good things that come in small packages. Yeah. And you only have to look at the energy bills of consumers in Texas at the moment to find out what the capital cost to the individual person is on on we won't, where we, we things won't go make wrong. Any comment about how the politicians are dealing with it because it's not going well. Yeah, <laughs> a tricky one. Um, well, time ti one time is it. time is to an end. It, it takes me a great pleasure, Helena, to say thank you very much for joining us Thanks. today. Everything you've said is very insightful, Brilliant. and as ever, just fantastic uh, and on behalf of everybody here uh, um, what have what has the environment ever done for us uh, we look forward to speaking to you next month uh, and I think by by means of highly fantastic segues Vicky I believe next month we will be talking about nature